Uh, all right. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, you guys must be sort of eager to leave here and go straight to the bar or the happy hour, wherever. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, so my name is Ashish Narkarni. I'm, um, I'm the dumb moderator today. I don't know what this topic is about. I'm just going to ask questions. And then hopefully by the end of the panel, I'll learn something out of it. But we have a very entertaining and vocal panel. So I will leave it to them to, uh, to uh, introduce themselves and tell us a little bit more about what they do, what the company they're from, and what, uh, what uh, stuff we can talk about today. So Monty, you want to start? Sure. Uh, so hi, my name is uh, my name is Monty. Uh, I uh, I work at uh, at Red Hat um, in the in the office of technology, um, uh, doing CI uh, and CD related things. Uh, that that is largely because uh, my role in amongst my roles in the OpenStack community, uh, I uh, started the OpenStack CI. CD team that we refer to as Infra, who, who you saw several of our, our erstwhile members of uh, up on stage in the keynotes this morning, uh, so which was really uh, really super cool, um, uh, and also sit on the OpenStack uh, technical committee and uh, the board of directors because uh, apparently being on two different governance bodies is a great idea. Uh, it's a great way to spend your time, um, and in my in my spare time working on all of these things, I uh, I have a. Uh, sort of an unholy allegiance to a, a combination of Ansible and Puppet, which uh, scares most people as well it should. So, um, uh, but I'm, I'm here repping Ansible today. So, so I, I believe I'm supposed to punch you in the face. Okay. Yeah, okay. sweet. Awesome. Am I allowed to punch you back? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I yeah. would prefer it if you didn't, <laughs> but, uh, but I suppose it would be uh, not. I'll hold you guys back. Uh, great, I thank you. Yeah. I thank God. <laughs> Chris, is the, Chris is the middle passenger That's right. to keep you guys right. uh, yeah. away from each you other. You could just punch me, whereas I have to ride down into declarative DSO. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, we'll converge to the yeah. state of you having punched me. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, you want to go next? All right, that will be hard to beat. Um, <laughs> uh, Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Logan. I'm the practice lead at Dell EMC for application modernization in our services team. Uh, primarily, we, are, um, we develop solutions for customers to help them leverage a variety of technologies in the cloud native space, so all the way from applications, um, practices like Agile, Lean, DevOps, CI, CD, um, as well as uh, platform as a service, so technologies like Cloud Foundry, and on either hyperconverged infrastructure or on customers' own their own architecture. So, um, primarily, it's all about understanding what their business motivations are, what their challenges are, how to get them engaged in a solution, and how to start with them on it. So, looking forward to the panel. Cool. Hey, I'm Nigel Kirsten. I'm CIO at Puppet, which is sort of a strange title given what I do. I have people who run back office IT and business operations, but I run the SRE group and I run community. I've been at Puppet about six years, which is sort of forever. We run the State of DevOps report every year. We've been doing that five or six years, long before anyone with any money actually cared about DevOps. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Who's actually read the abstract for this panel? Of the oh. people who read it, who would like to actually hear about those things? And, and more importantly, for those who haven't read the panel, or, or the, have, have read the abstract, do you agree or disagree? Because I think that's the main <laughs> topic we are going to start off with, right? In the, so, so in the spirit of full, full disclosure, we were just exchanging emails on questions, and someone, I think Neil, Nigel started by saying he disagreed with the abstract. So we said, why not, what's better than start off with that question? So, <laughs> you know, you disagree with the abstract. So let's, so the abstract is, uh, well, the, the topic is infrastructure limitations on DevOps. And I believe, Nigel, you disagree, so. Yeah, I feel like the premise of the abstract to, I guess, set up the straw man that we're all about to either knock down or try and support was that agile application development and DevOps practices are actually incompatible with managing infrastructure in a traditional way. And I disagree, yeah. so. Who wants to mount the case for the? We're both looking at you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I, I, I think actually that there is a case for both, but for the most part, I think that there, it's usually the challenges, if there are some, I think come into more organizational issues and how organizations can realign themselves to accomplish this 
think Conway's law, it's difficult for organizations to change the way they operate, and so they manufacture challenges because of resistance to change. I think in greenfield environments where you have a clear path to how you want to accomplish this, I think technology solutions are pretty straightforward. I mean, I think it's actually pretty easy to solve most problems in greenfield environments. You don't have any customers. You're not actually making any money out of it. The reality is, for most companies, all of the most interesting stuff is what often gets termed legacy, which is the software that actually supports the business. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, was, I was having a thought. Uh, so I have, I have my normal sort of things that I, I like to toss uh, uh, at, at, at some of these concepts to, to whatever. But, but it, it just sort of struck me as, as um, uh, here that so the, there's this, this whole uh, cloud native concept, which has some positives and negatives and whatnot. But, um, but popped into my head, there's, this, there's been this theory that we've got this new generation of kids running around who are the digital natives, right? And, and they've, they've grown up with computers all their lives, so clearly they're going to be, they're going to do stuff on the computers that like blows our minds, right? And, and it actually turns out they're morons um, as it relates to computers, or at least not any better than we are, because they've had really, really well-functioning computers in their pockets for their entire life, so they, they don't have a tinkerer's a natural sort of tinkers, let's take apart this computer. Because if they take apart the computer in their pocket, it stops working um, very quickly. Uh, and I, and it, I think the know? problem's actually worse for the children of those of us who are actually tinkerers. Yeah. I read a really great piece talking about how, you know, if your computer broke when you were a kid, like our age, my mother and father weren't going to fix it. Yeah. It was, like, it was if, us. I, if I had to fix it, and there was no internet, yeah. so you weren't actually able your, to get Your kid help. fixes no the computers. Guess who fixes it? Yeah. You yeah. are. And if, you know, especially if you work in technology, your router or Wi-Fi goes down at home. There's sort of this professional pride of yeah. fixing it. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my thing right. And so I, it, it makes me, so my, my concern, like, because I think there's a bunch of, of, of really good uh, concepts that are, that are encoded, you know, in, in, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, you know, sort of cloud native, uh, description of, of how things go, and there's there's some really positive stuff there. Um, I, I have a I have an, a long-standing concern that that there's this undercurrent of because uh, we've all decided that the developers are the most important thing in the world for some reason, um, and and that we should we should make them happy no matter what. Um, but there's this undercurrent of of interest in being able to 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 just write some code and not have to know how any of that infrastructure crap works. So if I may right? paraphrase that for those yeah. people tweeting in the crowd, it's yeah. Monty says cloud native developers are morons. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely what I just said. Yeah. Uh, all cloud native application developers are morons. No, it, but that's, that's actually, I mean, there's another problem, which is that we, we, we only seem to be able to produce thoughts that are tweetable. Uh, and it turns out that the reality is much more nuanced uh, that, than that. Um, uh, in any case, I, I, I really worry that we're building a culture of people who have ceased to want to know how the underlying things work. I actually like it when I don't have to reconfigure my router every day. That's fantastic, right? But I also sort of want to know some amount of, of how that stuff works, because then even if I'm using an easier framework on top of it, I can understand how that's, I mean, I, before OpenStack, I worked for MySQL as a database consultant, and I did a lot of performance tuning. And the number of people who thought that there was this immense black magic going on inside of the database, that they would just let the database handle it. I'm like, well, here's what happens when you're doing a join. There's, there's a nested for loop, literally. There's a nested for loop in the code that it's just written in C, right? So it's faster than doing it in your, in your interpreted language. But it's not, it's not magic. There's still, if you have a billion rows and you're joining them with a billion rows, you have, you have a billion squared iterations of a CPU that's got to do something. And so you can, it turns out you can easily reason about what is the cost of doing this thing. Like it's not, it's not hard if you learn about it, right? But it seems very scary and black magic to people and they don't really want to know how SQL works behind the scenes and ugh, God, it's scary. And all these, because we're essentially piling abstractions upon abstractions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, and like and, at the moment, and they're all leaky. Yeah, they're all leaky. Um, I, and I, I think they're, they are beneficial. Like I'm not trying to say we shouldn't do that, but I, I want to make sure that I'm, my concern is that culturally, as a, as a tech community, we don't go so far down the road that we, we encourage people to, to value being ignorant, right? Like the, the, sometimes you may not be able to know something. I don't know anything about how NFV works. People keep saying NFV, and I'm yes. like, ah. But you know. Well, I, I think so, that when, when, you yeah, think, when you think about how most business software is developed, you end up with specializations of skills. And mm -hmm. so uh, I think that's been the case probably for, you know, past 20 years at least, oh, yeah. and 
I think culturally that's not changing anytime soon until recently with the advent of full stack developers and with combinations of DevOps teams. Yep. I think that without, I think that cloud native gives you somewhat of a, a better model for how to architect applications in a way that can, that where you have a better likelihood of being able to abstract away so, the totally. infrastructure. Yeah, well, so, so, the, a, so the question then is since we're talking about cloud native and since we are at OpenStack and since we're talking about dev and ops, uh -oh. <laughs> how do you balance it out? Uh, sort of an open-ended question. So, you know, is there any secret stuff like you talked about CI CD at OpenStack? If yeah. there was no CI CD at OpenStack, what would OpenStack look like in the context of cloud native? Well, if there were no CI for OpenStack, I don't think we would all be sitting here right now. Um, the distros uh, might be almost successful. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> possibly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but like that, that is one of those tools that that actually take the cloud native part and stick it over in the, in the side for a second, put a pin in it. Um, operating literally anything these days without without some sort of CI system is insane and irresponsible, right? Like it, it doesn't matter whether you're doing, turns out you can do CI on things that are not cloud native applications. We install and test OpenStack 20,000 times a day. Um, and I will tell you right now, it is not a cloud native application. Right. Um. <laughs> it's one of the, when, when we talk to customers about how, to, how they need to start going on a path to cloud native, we talk to them first about taking their legacy applications that they may or may not ever move there and say, get control of that first, mm -hmm. implement some predictability in the build and test deployment capabilities of it, yep. and start there. That way you can, first of all, get, get your feet wet with it, but, but more importantly, get some predictability and control. I think that without that, that's where the kind of hero, the hero aspect of software development comes mm -hmm. in that is, you know, it's it, the person it, it, who's coded themselves yeah, into job security. Exactly. I think, I think one of the big shifts to, you know, whatever you're doing, if you're making a digital transformation to agile, IT, DevOps, cloud native, whatever, the tech is only a, big, a small part of it. A lot of it's the process inside an enterprise. Mm -hmm. One of the most dysfunctional stories I came across at a customer in the last few years was talking to them about um, puppet content. And they were like, well, it's just too slow for us to adopt modules from the forge. And I was like, that's pretty weird because you just kind of type puppet module install. And they were like, oh, we can't do that. We've got a security policy that is all users and groups must be represented in a single configuration file. So we have to take all of this upstream content all these other people have written, modify it, pull all the users and groups out of it into a single file. That takes us about three weeks. Then a new version's come out, so we spend another week or two catching up to it, and then we deploy it. And I was like, well, why are you doing that? And the security guy in the corner is just like, because that's our policy. And, yeah. and that's yeah. the sort of crap that actually I think is slowing people down. It's actually, it's your you can manage traditional enterprise software yeah. in a pretty traditional way, rethink a lot of your policies and processes around them to be sort of sane and relevant to the actual year you're living in and achieve huge benefits. Well, so, one of the big challenges we have when talking to companies is how do they take their existing development infrastructure management model and break down the silos and the processes that exist between them to create more holistic teams that can do all the development and changes necessary within one sprint in order to get something done. But when you have issues like that, it's, yeah. it, it works against it. So when, you, when you've got multiple generations of ITIL rules lawyers in your organization, yeah. that's, like that's your biggest problem. J Jonathan Bryce has, uh, in, in one of the talks, he, he gives uh, around the places a, a, a story that I'm going to paraphrase, so it's going to be all wrong. Uh, so sorry, Jonathan. Um, uh, but he's talking about a, a, a you know, company that was adopting, adopting OpenStack, moving to cloud, and, and beforehand, because they, 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 they had a problem, right? Like they, it took them, I think, 38 days to roll out a new change, right? And that was, they, they were not happy with that as a business. Um, and so they, they implemented cloud, um, and, uh, and, and as, a, as a result, they were able to roll out new changes in 37 days. Um, and uh, they, they were uh, they were they were less than pleased uh, with the results of their of their journey to the cloud. Right? They're like, why did not fix it? It's because they hadn't changed any of their process, their business processes and thinking. So they still had people go through paper requisition forms to be able to make the API call to the cloud to spin up a VM. Right? Um, and uh, and and so it it was really the so having cloud there did allow them to adopt some things that eventually to to allow them to to speed up the the way they were doing. Things, but one of the real wins, uh, I think, actually, in this case, having cloud there uh, allowed them to not use 
their technology stack as a scapegoat for their, you know, oh, we have old, these old bare metal machines and they won't, they won't allow us to do this. It was actually their processes were killing them, right? And, and, and in this case, it put them into stark relief. Like, oh, well, now we're on cloud and it still sucks. Uh, maybe we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and, and decide that, that possibly filling out paper requisition forms and handing them to the one person who takes them upstairs and his secretary hands them to the other person and, you know. And you can do all of this without actually going to the cloud. Mm -hmm. You know, like Absolutely. you can sit down and take the lessons of a 12-factor app, yep. writing microservices, having sure. a database service so, rather than using RDS, and achieve all of these benefits. Like yeah. the cloud's so not magical, is, it just forces constraints. So is yeah. the right way to see this as app dev forces infrastructure changes, forces organizational changes, or is it some I think it's more the business yeah. is failing at actually delivering value to people. Yeah. That's right. And so take a systems thinking approach to the whole thing. Yeah. What's and broken? whether that pressure from your org is coming from the app developers, whether it's come from your security team who are just going, seriously, if I stare at one more log file as my job, I'm going to shoot myself. Or whether yeah. it's your operations people going, my pager hasn't stopped buzzing for three weeks. Like, someone somewhere is going to start screaming and going, this isn't working. Yeah, and someone at the top level is going to go, we're not making money and shipping things fast enough. Yeah, I think, I think the challenge in, in trying to fix the pieces, like treat cloud like a magic pill and just mm -hmm. take it and you're going to fix your problem and then you find that there's other aspects to it, you know, starting instead and saying, what's the shortest path for a change, a new feature or change to my configuration to get that from inception all the way through to production modeling what that shortest path looks like and then determining what's the development process, the testing, deployment, the infrastructure changes, and how, how is that going to work and then removing all those barriers and restructuring it. The problem is that in most enterprises, people's jobs are based upon yep. the fact that they run a gigantic organization that's responsible for this process and they're not w always willing participants yeah. in this helping is, to make to, to segue to your earlier sort of seemingly unrelated comments about the Cubs, <laughs> <laughs> like there's a reason well why all of the DevOps folks end up returning to lean manufacturing, lean, ma lean management, Toyota Carter, value stream mapping, like the manufacturing industries solved this a while ago and they went through this process of a whole bunches of jobs went away, we adopted automation and we worked out how do we actually shift value quickly like the yeah. process you described is the value stream mapping from the 70s. Yeah, right. when, and, it, and it turns out, like, and this is one of the reasons that I think that, that, that CI, CD things are so essential, whether you're doing cloud native apps or not. Like they're, they're applicable to, to, they can be applicable to anything. And a lot of that winds up being replace repetitive human tasks with automation. If it's a thing that I can't do better with creative thought, right, then it is not a, a valuable task for me to do as a human. As a human, the thing that I can do that a computer can't do is, is, is intuition and creativity, right? A computer can repeat the same task consistently, right? It will always do it the same way. Um, if your computer doesn't always do it the same way, then, then you as the human have, have broken the computer in some horrible, horrible way. Um, but, but you can do that. So all of those things were like, they, well, our process is we, 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 we cut the, the pre-release and then we hand it to QA who has a thousand people who all run through these manual test scripts where they check something manually to determine if it's, if it's right. And, and the reason people do that is that they want to, to instill a confidence that when you, when you deploy this change that it's going to be good. But, but even then, even with all of those humans doing all those things, you have to take human fallibility into account. And so people are still scared. They're still worried. So you introduce more process, more levels. So you, you go through one level of human testing, and then you put it into acceptance testing. And then you put it into, and you're like, why in the, what in the world are you doing there that you couldn't script and automate? And, and either, these can be, you could do all of this for anything that is on the computer, right? I think, I think some of the challenges in this area is, it's only until recently that a lot of hardware had the richness of APIs that could mm -hmm. allow you to automate it, as well as some tools to support the processes. So either you were forced to build it on your own, I remember the old days of building the, these different tools that you could use to drive a lot, a lot of stuff, and you turn yeah. into... Running Perl yeah. and a billion ex yeah. expect scripts yeah. SSHing yeah. into things. Yeah. yeah. You, turn your, you turn into Dominating your own into tool <laughs> development team. I mean, you know, think about the, you know, those days. And so I think as vendors have have um, started making serious products in these spaces and the ability to interact in a rich way with some of the, with hardware devices as well as different software layers. I think the ability 
to automate this and make it predictable and reliable is, yeah. I mean, I think it's here. In many ways, I think the biggest change has been we've somewhat democratized automation. Yeah. We, and we and I don't mean just in the infrastructure as code, Ansible, Puppet Chef space. I mean yeah. just sort of all over the place. We've actually got APIs that are accessible. We have. You were hacking crap together yeah. in well, the and, 90s. And like, so we, we, we run um, a, a, a wide variety of things. Some of them are, are what you might term, uh, I, I, would, I would term cloud native, that they don't actually fit strictly into a 12-factor application, but it turns out that's, uh, that's, a, that's a concept, not a, not a prescriptive set of guidelines, but some, some things that, are, that were definitely cloud-native because we wrote them specifically on top of cloud APIs, so <laughs> that, by that, all the way to things that are, you know, things running in Java war files, right, in, in, in whatever, and even those are made better by us having the cloud available because it's really easy for us to spin up a second VM, try out an upgrade, and if it and if it fails, just delete that VM and, and start over. Like we can, we can do some validation, even if it's a manual validation, because we haven't had the time to, to fully automate that. We can do a couple of trial runs with almost no cost compared to the, I have this one machine. If I wanted to do a trial run of deploying it to a, to a machine before I did my upgrade here, I'd have to have a whole other machine Right, which is like twice the cost, and now you've got to convince finance that you want to double the cost of your thing for a machine you're going to use once every three months, and they go, nope. Um, so, so, so it's so great. Like there, that's a that's a good point because yesterday when when they were talking about at the keynote, they they had a press conference after, and, and almost everyone in that list of folks who talked said that they have three distinct environments: one for like kicking the tires, one mm -hmm. for testing patches and then the production environment. And, yep. and it comes to OpenStack and they're do, still doing this. Um, isn't that some kind of um, a silly thing to do, that you have three environments? And Not if your processes are the same and you're actually making those consistent. I think that speaking to the fear point you raised mm -hmm. earlier, there are still humans interacting with these systems. And people are afraid of touching production. And you will actually get more innovation in your company if you create these environments where people can play without fear. Yeah. And they can be configured exactly the same way as production. You can push all your changes there exactly the same way. But when it comes to you know, a new employee who's only been there three weeks, they're like, well, I have an idea. I will try it out. But if they're going to try it out in production, they might not. Yeah, so we've, we've got a, so the, there's a, a, the team I work on wrote this tool called uh, Zool, which I'll, I'll plug right now just because it's fun because I'm up on here on stage and I can. Um, but, uh, but it's the thing we use it for OpenStack development, right? And, um, and it's, uh, it, it, one of the things that it, that it allows us to do um, is this thing we refer to as, as, as gating, right? Which, which basically means it's, it's not going to land in the thing that's going to go to production until it's, it, like, it's physically there's a, the computer is going to prevent it from merging if it doesn't pass all of the tests. Of course, the, that's only as good as the tests are, right? But, but it gives you the mechanism to put things in place that, that, that allow you to have that freedom. I can, I can push up a patch and, and have more confidence that it, like, so it, like even in ephemeral, we spin up a, 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 if you have the automation to be able to do a deployment and an upgrade in a, in a, in a sort of throwaway environment, then you can script, uh, you know, sort of, sort of as we do, hey, I just, I just submitted a patch for review. It hasn't even been code reviewed yet, but we'll, we'll spin up some machines and deploy it and, and do an upgrade from the current version that's in, that's in production and all of those things, um, and then re report on, on that uh, and then when somebody actually reviews it, we'll, we'll do all that again, just to make sure that nothing's changed and, and nothing's broken. So you, you as the reviewer can, as the human reviewer can focus on, is this a good idea, right? Is this, is this a good thought? Not, is this going to break production? Because you've got, you've got automatic confidence inducing things that are, that are there that the developer doesn't have to, you know, so if, if your, your path involves three, three environments and you can repeatedly do that, that's great. There's, there's a theoretical path that you can get to where you have one environment combined with a, an infinite number of, of copies of production that computers manage for you as needed, right? So you don't, have, you don't necessarily have to have a static copy of, of thing. You, you have the, the, because we have infrastructure as code, you have the ability to replicate production. Right. And especially if you combine it with development mm -hmm. practices like feature flags and mm -hmm. dark features and yep. all of those things. I mean, I think the amazing thing, again, about what you just said is none of this is rocket science. Like, you have to do it. The people who, you know, are always like, how do I do DevOps? It's like, well, do you have any good developers? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do they manage their practices? Software engineering worked most of this crap out quite a while ago yeah. because it learned the lessons from manufacturing. Yeah. I think in many ways you could say DevOps is operations and infrastructure people 
finally waking up and going, you know what, these people we interact with, they've solved a whole bunch of problems yeah. that we should just solve the same way. Yes. I, think it, it, so, yeah, that's a, I was going to say an interesting example, um, something very similar to what you were describing. Uh, we were working with an insurance company who were, were attempting to blur the lines between those different environments and um, they stood up one Cloud Foundry environment and used basically pipelines for provisioning infrastructure and containers within it, basically where the, they, had, they used the routing basically into the, into the instances into, to manage what was production and not production. Mm. So all the workloads internally could be, or were just running some version of it. And what, however, it was, however you mapped your, the URL into it became production and how whatever you t attached to from a data source perspective. But they basically shared the, the physical infrastructure as a, you know, one big um, set of compute resources. And I think they learned a lot that, that there's less complexity when you can do it that way, but you have to be able to manage, be conscious of the risk that you're not, you know. Which I think speaks exactly to the premise of the abstract that we're sort of finding ourselves disagreeing on. You can have a super reliable hardware infrastructure layer and as more and more things just become either software or can just be treated like software, you have all this flexibility to sort of create those sort of segmented different areas of quality or data protection or however yeah. you want to treat it. Yeah. So that, that's a good question, uh, that's a good point. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions to ask, we are coming up on like the remaining 10 minutes or so. Anyone, questions? We're willing to babble about any topic. <laughs> Yeah, open-ended, anything. It doesn't have to be about DevOps or infrastructure. Right? I can tell you about some great coffee shops in Barcelona. <laughs> it's always a cub. Yeah. If anyone is feeling lazy, they can just yell and we can repeat. Or we could just all um, yell. So I recently had to talk some executives down from having a dashboard to monitor the CI CD implementation. They were hoping to um, push through collectively for an entire uh, Org that shall remain nameless. Don't look at my badge. Um, uh, and, and one of the things that I tried to explain to them when they were talking through the metrics that they wanted to see in order to assess whether they were successful um, was that the things that they were privileging might cause fear in the developers if they went red <laughs> um, and, and create behavior and reactional reactionary behavior in the developers that actually went against the main principles of CI CD. I was wondering if you had any great metrics that you could recommend for organizations to look at that, that wouldn't inspire fear? I think you probably have the right metrics, um, but there's a cultural problem there. Like it's the same thing as when agile software development happened. If you're moving in smaller chunks, more are gonna fail. And if your organization has you know, this fear of, if it ever goes red, we're all doomed. Like that's the problem. Like, because the whole point of taking an agile, small chunks, moving in a way so you can course correct more frequently is you're going to fail more often, but your overall velocity is much, much higher. So there's sort of a cultural gap there. And I, and I totally understand, like in many companies, if you tell all the developers, hey, by the way, if you ever break the build, the CEO will see that in, his, in their office. Yeah, the, the cost so, be so is it, you is reduce it the cost of, of failing. Yeah, yeah that's it, exactly is right. Is it a question of companies looking at risk in a different way or taking risks in a different uh, ma or CYA kind I, of I like your reference back to, to lean manufacturing, which is how quickly can I validate some hypothesis for my business in a way that where my infrastructure and my applications, there's it's the least amount of work I need to do in order to test this. Yeah. And, and I think that's really ultimately how you but, show value. But that there's requires a, you to change the way you how think. You, yeah, how yeah. you think you change, and what. Like a good example of this, uh, I've, I've been involved in, in several arguments about uh, deploying OpenStack in a continuously delivered manner from master as opposed to deploying stable releases of, of OpenStack. And in general, the conversation goes a little bit like this. I want to deploy the stable release because I want to deploy the stable software and I want to minimize my risk. And I'm like, okay, well, the thing that you're doing is you're setting yourself up for a six months worth of change uh, 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 event every six months because we do have a six month release cycle. Um, so while I can see that the word stable might make you think that you're, that you're minimizing your risk, you're actually increasing it because you've increased the amount of risk you're taking at any one given point in time. Whereas if you set your organization and your thinking up so that you're deploying 10 times a day, then think about how small the risk of each of those deployments is. And, and what you're actually doing there is you're minimizing the risk into 
into, into manageable bite-sized chunks. And this is exactly the thing. It's the, it's the same. And these are all of these conversations have been with companies who have theoretically adopted Agile, yeah. right? Yeah. But they haven't adopted Agile because all they've done is their engineering teams have adopted Agile and their executives right. are, are still are still The business, thinking, still the business is not adopting yeah. Agile at all. So, so and risk is just one side of that. Like, yeah. just to jump in, like, every time you're taking that risk is a learning opportunity. Yeah. And you can learn an awful lot from only deploying once every six months. Sure. But you're learning it all at once. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Which is <laughs> you're learning the hard way. So <laughs> I, I think to come back to the original question, get the, if you've got that sort of cultural fear, work out something that everyone agrees on measures quality. Because who cares what happens in the pipeline? Yeah. Like really, like if the pipeline's red three quarters of the time, and in the end it means you're shipping every three days and the actual overall quality of whatever it is you're creating is better, like that's the metric the high level management should be caring about. In, in a sense, they should be happy if they're seeing failures because they're like, oh, people are trying things. I think change is actually happening through the org and we're not going to increase quality without creating change. So, so, so focus so, less on, on failures in the process and more in whether it meets the business objectives. Yeah, and I'd argue it's not even a failure in the process. It's like anyone who's been through science, Correct. you know, yeah. there's this Who's whole... Who's the agent of change here to, to, to think about this differently? I mean, you talked the, about the engineering teams having implemented mm -hmm. Agile, but the infrastructure side is still in a different way. Oh no, it's, this, it's the executives that are that are that are all, almost always the the problem, um, because everybody likes to blame the engineers because the engineers don't have any cultural or political power inside of an organization. So really, what I'm now uh, advocating for is uh, is a communist overthrow of um, uh, uh, power to the farmers. Uh, um, so that uh, narco syndicalist uh, approach. Yeah, narco syndicalist yeah. approach to, to software. But but quite honestly, a lot of this problem is is that you have these organizations that are trying to go through these transformations, and none of them ever think to transform their their uh, old thinking uh, uh, upper executive set. So you have you have maybe they hired a whole bunch of of you know hot new uh, people down in the in the ranks to to do, to do stuff, and then and then the, the folks sitting on top of that are the people who have been there for forever and. And that doesn't mean that a person who's been there forever has to necessarily, there's a bunch of people who are, turns out that the, the, the myth that all of the 20 year olds know more than the, than the 50 year olds is, is quite a myth. Um, but, but you have to be able to assess and judge whether, um, whether somebody is, is, is the, the, the organization is embracing the change holistically. And if, if, the, if the change is stopping kind of at some executive level, then there's an executive problem. It's not a problem the engineering team isn't implementing it correctly, right? Like that's, now how you implement that change is, is, a, is a very good question and it sort of depends on how your executive compensation structure works and, and how involved the people that are in charge I are. mean they're ultimately responsible, but again yeah. I'd sort of take challenge with the question like who is the agent of change? It depends. Yeah. You know there are some organizations where I've everything. seen a developer, <laughs> kind of has, the innovators a developer dilemma, has think, built a thing, extent. you know, yeah. and then everyone goes, wow that thing's really cool. I mean, look at, you know, what's the classic innovation story with 3M? You yeah. know, some guy was mucking around with glue and a bunch of pieces of paper and went, oh, wow, these would make these little post-it notes. Yeah. And that's like this billion dollar business for them. And then well, they I'm, made sticky tape. And, and, and so let me qualify my question. The agent yeah. of change when it, so you mentioned the executives, but who convinces the executives to change their thinking? I mean, it's a I think it's usually CIO magazine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe the United brochure in the yeah, back. Yeah, I, th I think it's actually, <laughs> it's actually we need we need more brochures in the back of, yeah. of seat back pockets in, in first class. Oh, not, I just I just go not in economy. As I as I board the plane, I yeah. just try and fill the so, back. So, I, yeah. I, I really enjoy what? when there's when there's an ad for for private jets. Uh, yeah. in, in and I'm sitting in economy in a middle seat, and there's a private jet ad, and I'm like, I can't even get up <laughs> in the first class. You're <laughs> trying to sell me on a private jet? What's That's wrong funny. with you? I, I think if you had to point a finger at someone, I think in a lot of organizations, it's probably the CIO or the CTO, um, you know, thinking back about companies I've worked for where there's basically a revolving door at mm -hmm. that level because they come in with a big plan to make changes to affect the business and they're approaching it from a very traditional model and the reality of it is it's really hard to do. And so they, you know, leave after a few years because they weren't successful. They didn't know how to measure. They didn't know how to, or they didn't know how to sell it to the, to their leadership. Yeah. And I mean, I think that they're ultimately the ones because the the whole the business basically how the business is run below that and how they how they communicate the ability of technology back to the lines of business. I think it, it's really sits at that level. Um, but it's a difficult place for them to be in, and they need people to support them. In it. And I think, I think the pressure is coming from an interesting place. One one of the places I'm seeing 
for better or for worse, as the buzzword of DevOps like makes its way through the C level suite, through the through the C suite, we've got people like Ernst and Young sending out literally pamphlets to board members of companies going, your CIO is now your chief innovation officer. If they don't have a DevOps strategy, you're all doomed. <laughs> and so no, literally then you're having the board meetings where you've got board members who haven't some of them haven't run companies for years will suddenly go, well, so what about this DevOps thing? What's your DevOps strategy? And the CIO starts freaking out in the board meeting and then goes to their VP or director of technology and goes, seriously, we need to rub some DevOps on everything. Yeah. And like, that's a pretty clueless and sort of horrible dysfunctional anti-pattern, but it's at least giving incentive to the developers and the operations and the infrastructure folks to go, you've got a mandate for change. And in some ways they get to educate up. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's also, I, I think, um, similar to, to that, or, or in, in, in contrast, or in, in conjunction with that, is the the various sort of business finance side of things, right? Because if there's a, if there's a more traditional outlook on on how you finance the lines of business, right? How how you how you hand out the, the CIO can have all the DevOps strategy in the world that they want, um, but if, if finance comes and says that, well, we've got these, or an HR says, we've got these really strict, you know, tiers of guidelines of, of what you can, what you, who you can hire and where and how and all of that type of stuff, and then all of a sudden the, the CIO is like, well, I was going to do DevOps, but the only people that I can afford are these guys that are, that are standing out back of the gas station, um, and uh, they, they told me they can, they can do some DevOps for me for like $20. Um, and that's like you're, but this you're, is why I think it's important yeah. to actually remember one of the original things of DevOps is measurement. Yeah. Like, right. I was really horrified when we hit this certain point in doing the DevOps survey where we started going, well, you know, statistically we can show these companies make more money, their stock prices are higher, yeah. they're achieving their business goals more regularly. And suddenly we're meeting with IT directors who are like, my CFO insists <laughs> that we investigate this infrastructure as code thing. And you're like, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and but so we've got to, we've got to talk about the stuff we do. Well, they've optimized. They've, they've optimized crazy. around their current yeah approach. Yeah. But there's and there's there's two there's there's a, there's a couple different ways that, that you that you make more more money. Of course, I mean there's many, but but there's 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 cutting costs and there's there's increasing revenue, right? There's doing more yeah. or or paying less to do it. And and one of the uh, one of the things that I, I keep seeing in, in in places is the folks hearing DevOps and thinking. I get to pay less for all of the things that I yeah. want to do. And I'm like, it's not necessarily going to work out that way. What it may be is that if you that you might get more for the amount of money that you were paying, or you may just you actually may pay the exact same, get the exact same, but not lose in the marketplace. Yeah. Like that yeah. that also may be that like don't expect magical ponies and rainbows to dance out of all the developers' you know faces all of a sudden. Yeah, I, I think, think this really uh, hilarious. Unless you took a bunch of acid. There was a hilarious definition of DevOps I'm gonna repeat for at least the next few weeks that someone told me, which was DevOps for developers is like we don't need operations, mm -hmm. but for operations people, it's oh we get to do some development. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's yeah, that's a great <laughs> comment. So we are out of time, but uh, oh, before we uh, um, before we uh, leave for the day, we have a raffle, and um, if you have a couple of more minutes, I'd love to have you guys uh, sort of looking at it from your side. You know what you would present as one big case for um, you know, changing the manner in which companies think of this. Um, you should take a systems thinking approach to your whole business and probably do something like value stream mapping to work out what actually delivers value and how much it costs. Awesome. Chris? Yeah, I think that is, that's an approach that we advocate a lot with customers. I think that, that you also need to look at what's the right level of integration you need from a technology standpoint. Some customers are happy to be able to put the pieces together because they need to be very flexible and others need a more integrated solution. And I, you know, I think figuring out where your company is at, I think is important. Demand APIs from your vendors. Yes, yeah, exactly. demand APIs from your vendors. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I agree with, with absolutely both of those things. I think that, that you've, got to, you've got to look at the whole, the whole business. It can't just be, can't just be I'm, gonna, I'm gonna dump more stuff on, over on the, the more requirements on the, on the tech side without, without giving more resources. Like you, you, and, and without changing how I do things over, over here in, in, the, in the business, you know, business ops side of things, you've got to, got to think holistically um, and, and look at the whole thing, figure out where things are, are breaking down. You know, if your security compliance stuff is taking you, you know, months to get through, turns out there's people who are doing that uh, uh, pre pretty quickly. Um, and so, it, you know, it may be that you need help figuring that out. Um, it, you know, it, it, everybody is working through this, so there's plenty of people who can, who can be helpful. 
um, in in those endeavors. But but it's not it's not ever going to be just a one a, a one trick pony or a, or a one shot fix. You've got to be willing to to look from the from the very top from the C-suite all the way down to the to the thing and figure out what's what's working and not working and how can I measure it? Like how can yeah. I measure yeah, not just how can I measure the engineer's productivity, how can I manage the, the finances productivity? Yeah. And not just from a what's the bottom line, because obviously that's that's everybody's productivity. But like how can I manage finances impact on on engineering? Like, so that that's actually a good know? one like, for that dashboard. Maybe a way to combat the engineer fear is go, we're putting that dashboard up. The other one we're gonna put in too is Time from filing expense report to engineer getting paid. Yes, huh. like yes. Some, something like that. Showing yeah. we're going to measure all bits of the business. We measure all the people, and that's that's a, yeah. that's exactly right. Put the put the put the heat yeah. on the on, on yeah. them. So now for all the patient listeners, we have a ruffle who wants to do the honors. Ah, it's all you, <laughs> Nigel. Wow, I thought there would be more of you. Two hundred and ninety-three. Who's the lucky winner? Two ninety-three. 